number. And I called him up and I asked him, I said, Doc, we are looking to have a marge so that we can shed some light on injustices here, not just in Memphis, but all around this country. And uh, we, we exchanged pleasantries, talked for a little while. And uh, I said, will you put the word out for me that we need the seminarians, we need the church world to show up. He said, well, Daryl, I'm not going to only put the word out for you. He said, I'm coming to march with you. He said, I I'll be there when you get there. He said, is that all right? I said, absolutely. What else was I to say? And so we marched together on that day and had an opportunity to learn and to understand that we are so much more inclined to being together and unified. And there's more, so much more that we share in common than we do apart and in difference. And so after the hymn of preparation, the next voice that you will hear will be that of our president and the preacher of the hour, none other than the president of MTS, Memphis Theological Seminary, Dr. Jody Hill. Hear ye him. Let's show him some love. sinners saved by grace. If I could, just let me say this. I, I saw a, a picture on Facebook this, this week since we're talking about leadership uh, of the old deacons of New Sardis. I think it was Sheriff Medlock that put it on there. Deacon Medlock, Deacon Dave Campbell, Harvey Tucker, Ed Lee Pruitt. And then my mind went to running back and I thought about those good old days and I thought about my mama and my grandmama. And I thought about how Pastor Lucima Gray used to call me all at once just to sing God's amazing grace. And that's what James did to me yesterday. So I blame James. But anyway, I want you to go back with me for a little while. Maybe it was your grandmother, your mother, your auntie, or somebody down the street, but just go back with me when you were young. I was young. Grandmother John and as the clouds gather at the close of the day. Mother's knee in all those days that used to used to be my grandmother would say. Grab 
another one And she was so good and kind She often told me Church, she often told me Son, you won't find Oh, not another Who would share All that young grief that was So I took my I took my grandmother at a and I saw the blessing.
Amen. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, choir. I think I want to take this senior choir home with me today when worship is over. What a beautiful gift of leading us in worship. The music, the songs, the love, the energy, the spirit. What a joy it is to be with you. I'm going to have a little prayer for us as we begin. And uh, tell you what, I'll hold off a minute on the prayer. We will uh, have that prayer for illumination shortly as we're transitioning. But the first things I want to say to you today is thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be with you, my dear friend, Pastor Harrington. And thank you for New Sardis, for your passion, for your energy, for your generosity in supporting and sustaining our ministry of equipping leaders in the church at Memphis Theological Seminary. You are light in the darkness. We are grateful for your abundant generosity. My first experiences, one of my first experiences at Memphis Theological Seminary, beyond being a student, serving on the board of trustees, I had a meeting where we had several different leaders from the community come and visit with us. And it was a pastor named Dr. Lasimba Gray who spoke of the difference at Memphis Theological Seminary. He said, what drew me to this place was even as a student, the president in the 70s, may have been the late 60s, but I believe it was in the 70s, walked into the chapel where the custodian, Mr. Ed Shannon, strong African-American leader at the seminary for a long time, was changing a light bulb in the chapel. The president walked into the custodian's presence and said, Mr. Shannon, when you are finished, would you mind coming by the president's office for a few moments? Mr. Gray said to speak with that man with integrity, with respect, and appreciation told me that this place was different. It is holy ground. Our ministry in Memphis began in 1964, the height of the civil rights movement in our city. The leaders, the forebears who came before us said, we want to be a place where my brother, Pastor Harrington, said, where we celebrate what we hold in common more than anything that divides us. So we opened our doors to all different denominations, some 25 different denominations today. The majority are Baptist. Majority are African-American Baptists, shall we say. And during that time, the commitment to the church, to be the church, to all people, regardless of differences, theologically, politically, racially, economic, social backgrounds, we want to be one in our Savior. That's what began the mission of our church. And when I first became president, now in my fourth year, I began having discussions with local leaders, local movers in our church who loved our seminary, who loved our city, and who loved the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I started getting asking questions. I said, President Hill, the African-American church has been faithful to Memphis Theological Seminary. Can we see some reciprocation? Can we see some of that faithfulness turn toward the heritage and worship styles and upholding our traditions in the faith too? So one of the first things I was fortunate to be a part of with encouragement from my friends like Pastor Harrington. My trustee member, Dr. Keith Norman, our faculty member and associate dean, Dr. Chris Davis, we started having discussions saying, you know, we have a Methodist house of studies. We have a Cumberland Presbyterian house of studies. What do you think about us developing a house of black church studies? So we sought funding assistance from the Alilia Endowment to begin that discernment. How can we serve the African American community, more specifically the black church, to continue to enhance leaders more well equipped to serve our children as we spoke of and serve the community? So we had a choice. We had a choice seeking funding from the Lilly Endowment, from Lilly Pharmaceuticals, who's been very good to our seminary. 
We asked for a million dollars. Would you give us a million dollars to help us begin the work of the House of Black Church Studies at Memphis Theological Seminary? We were awarded that grant, and we continue and began that work today. I know Dr. Karen Todd spoke to you about some of our summer institutes coming. Check it out. Look at it online. Dr. Andre Johnson will be providing leadership, Dr. Todd and others. But in addition to that, all that million does is gets us going. He said, that'll sustain us for five years, but we want this ministry to continue until Jesus comes back. So we're already building that house of studies for sustainability, and guess who's in the trenches with us? We had a fundraising event a year or so ago, and the challenge was, can, can you as a church, can you as a leader commit to $5,000 to be one of our torchbearers to continue this ministry? You know what one meddling pastor did? One meddling pastor stood up and said, can it only be 5000 Can we do 10000 Pastor Darrell Harrington meddled into pushing it up just a little bit more. God bless you, sir, and you Sardis. Thank you. You know, that's one of the things that gets me excited. And I'm going to start preaching in a little bit, I promise. One of the things that really gets me excited about putting this lapel pin on each day and representing our institution, yes, we're equipping leaders. We're preparing them to preach and to teach and to live out the faith of Christ, but also we are sustaining them economically along the journey so they don't have huge amounts of debt. It costs about $20,000 every year to educate one student. That's how much it costs. We charge our students less than half that amount in tuition. Some pay even less through scholarships, and because of partners like you. That's the thing. When I get up every day, I say, can I raise $10,000 one more time? Can I help one more student find their way to Memphis Theological Seminary next year? And in doing that, paying that difference that they don't have to pay, impact their ministry for a lifetime and the kingdom of our Lord forever. That's a pretty good return on investment, isn't it? So thank you, New Sardis, for being one of those in the trenches with us and sustaining our ministry. That's the first thing I wanted to say today. Now let's let's get into the word, okay? I want to say just a brief prayer for illumination as we reflect upon our scripture reading. Oh, my God, we, we bow in your presence, grateful for your grace, O Holy Spirit. Grateful, O Lord, that you give us the words and the meditation. We ask that they be pleasing and acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Your holy scripture tells us, O Lord, that Jesus, you were the word made flesh. So will you open our ears? Help us to hear. Your holy word also tells us, God, that you are the light of the world. So will you open our eyes? Help us to see. Your grace, O oh God, is the wellspring of life. Will you open our hearts? Help us feel and know the living waters of your grace. Come, O oh Holy Spirit, move us and make us more in your image and for your glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. I'm going to share some selected verses from Nehemiah. If you're not up on your Nehemiah too much, we'll do a little background and talk about Nehemiah, great prophet in the Old Testament, in the exiled Israel. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. And cupbearer to the king was more than just somebody serving wine. That was a trusted advisor, advocate for the king in those times where you never knew who was out to get you. You wanted the last person tasting your wine to be somebody you knew you could trust, making sure there wasn't no poison, nobody looking out for your downfall. So this was Nehemiah, moved up to what some would say the second highest position in all of the kingdom, advisor to the king. So I'm going to share here from uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. I'll also touch on various other parts of this chapter. I really hope and pray that there's something in this message today that will speak to you that you can take with your journey, okay? Let's begin, though, in chapter 1 from Nehemiah, if I can get it back up here. I'm using the iPhone app today, so uh, 
If not, we'll go over to the King James Version. Here we are, the words of Nehemiah Hekeliah in the month of Chislev. In the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, one of my brothers, Hananiah, came with a certain, excuse me, with certain men from Judah, and I asked them about the Jews that had survived, those who had escaped the captivity and about in Jerusalem. They replied, the survivors there in the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who knows covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Let your ears be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel, confessing the sins of my people Israel, which we have sinned against you, both I and my family have sinned. We've offended your, you deeply, failing to keep your commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me, keep my commandments and do them. Though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place at which I have chosen to establish my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great power and your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. The prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. At this time, I was cupbearer to the king. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. If you would, say with me, thanks be to God when I say this is the word of the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. So I want to speak to us on this Leadership and Legacy Sunday today. A bit about leadership. How about that? Will that work? I'm going to start my little timer, my recorder. Hopefully, uh, we won't go too long today, but I hope we'll have something we can take with us that will last us for our journey. To share with these thoughts on leadership, I, I like to make things simple. I like to keep it where I can remember it. I'm a simple-minded person at heart. So I built a little acronym with the word leadership, something that we can keep fresh in our mind to remember and remind us what are some examples of leadership that the prophet, the teacher, the leader Nehemiah gave to us today. So begin with the L of leadership. And it seems to me that one of the first things Nehemiah embodied was the L of leadership of listening. He was listening. Did you hear how it began this writing, his recollection, he said, brothers came to me from Jerusalem, and they told me we were in a terrible state. He not only listened to what they said, but he was moved by the words. You know he was really listening, right? He said he mourned, he prayed, he fasted for several days. Friends, if we're going to be leaders in this community, in our church, with our children, as Pastor Harrington poured out his heart to me today, we better start with listening. We can't come at them with all the answers. As we began our House of Black Church studies, we didn't just say, here it is. This is what we're going to do. First thing we said is, how can we better serve? I think it's a hard, at, my, my, at the heart of what I need to bring to this office, one who listens and wants to serve the grassroots of the church, our students, our community. You are the hope for Memphis and the world around us, New Sardis. So the L of Nehemiah that he gives to us is that spirit of 
listening, he speaks of how his brothers talked about their exile and their need for hope. So the E of leadership, after Nehemiah listened, we hear next that Nehemiah was one who had eyes on the horizon. In other words, he was a visionary. Okay? He was a visionary. Our scripture says this. In verse 4 it says, when I heard these things, here's what he did. I sat down, wept for several days and mourned, fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, I don't know about y'all. It's tempting to just jump in there and do something, right? Just jump in there and do something. He said he took several days. Visioning, praying, listening, and understanding this. Hear me, church, understanding this. Vision is central to the church, and vision does not come from us. It comes first and foremost from the Holy Spirit. We better give it to him. Because if it's our vision, it's Pastor Harrington's vision, vision or Jody's vision, that's all it is. It's only ours. When I first took the role of president, people would say to me, what's your vision, Reverend Wells? I said, I don't know. Hadn't been here long enough. I got to listen to my pastors. I've got to hear what the church needs. Most of all, I've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Nehemiah prayed and mourned and fasted and said, Oh, Lord, more of you and less of me. The A of leadership in Nehemiah's ministry, like this one. A of leadership means that all hands on deck. We need them all, don't we? We need everybody. Did y'all hear how we celebrated the work of this week? Reverend Wells' leadership, but then I heard pastor say some other word too. He said, let's celebrate not only Reverend Wells, but let's celebrate her team. Come on. Now, we had the old school choir here today. I'm going to have to back you off. I'm going to go a little old school on an analogy here. Some of y'all remember Rambo, young folk, maybe not. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, he was a bad man. Can they do it by themselves? Not really, can they? They ain't no real Rambos. Let me go back a little further. Y'all remember the Lone Ranger? Yeah. The Lone Ranger, I used to watch him every day after school. They don't have him on no more, I know. There ain't no such thing as Lone Ranger. Who'd he have? He had Tonto. Come on. It takes a team. And Nehemiah knew that. Hear the word of the Lord. Nehemiah said here in verses, uh, so let me just say this. I didn't read this portion. Go back and read it on your own. Chapter 3, he dedicates a whole chapter in this book celebrating what we celebrated with Reverend Wells today, his team. He told everyone involved, every role they had, how it would not have been possible to build that wall. You know how long it took them to build it? 52 days. 52 days would not have happened without all hands on deck. You are the hands and feet, New Sardis. Each and every one of you are part of this ministry, impacting our young people, our city, and our faith. Thank you for your ministry here. Nehemiah not only entrusted all hands, but he did this, the D of leadership. Don't fear change. Don't fear change if we're going to be leaders. Sometimes we got to change. We don't like to change. Nobody likes to change, right? Uh, you know what? The leadership gurus would tell you people are averse. I had to give you a fancy word. You know, I've been to seminary now. People are averse <laughs> to change. For the sake of gain, but they will embrace change if they're fear of losing something at the sake of loss. We got children that we don't want to lose. We got a community we don't want to lose. Sometimes we have to change. We have to don't fear it. You know, Nehemiah had so many attacks. Did you hear it? In a verse, uh, let's go, I'll jump back to chapter 2. Here's what Nehemiah met up with as he began building this wall. He was first, he, he, he went to the message. He took the message to the king. It says here in chapter 2, I'm going to share a few verses there, 2, 3, and 4. 
So he, the king asked Nehemiah, and here he is. He's number two. He's in the presence of the queen, and the king says, why does your face look so sad? You're not ill. This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. Here's what Nehemiah thought. He's thinking right as he heard this. This is how he recorded. I was very much afraid. He was afraid. But I still said to the king, come on. He was afraid, and we're going to have fear at times, but don't let fear conquer you or control you, right? <laughs> Nehemiah spoke up. He said, what do you want? He said, may the king live forever. Boy, that's a good response, wasn't it? Before he's going to ask something, he's going to tell him how much he appreciates him already. Why should my face not look so sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, here we go, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. He's praying again. He's praying again. He was fearful. And he met his prayer. His prayer met his fear, and his fear was conquered. We heard it spoke of this morning, friends. Prayer is real. It changes. It sustains us. It's the hope to conquer our fears in whatever perils we face. Nehemiah led in that way. That's the D of leadership. Don't fear. Don't be conquered by your fears. We got another E in the word leadership. We talked about the eyes on the horizon. That second E stands for this. Easy wins. Some people call it picking low-hanging fruit, right? If it's right there, go ahead and get it. Others call it opportunity leadership. Jim Collins, he wrote the book, Good to Great. Some of y'all will know. I know Doc probably read it, read it. Great leadership book. Stanford professor. He studied all the businesses and industries, top businesses in America. And say, what makes them different? What's the ones that rode the cream of the crop? How did they rise above? This was data-driven. He said, what I found, some of the most important ones, they kept it simple. They used a hedgehog concept, meaning do what you do. Do what you do better than anybody else and focus on that. What's the opportunities before you? What does new Sardis have that nobody else can do better on this planet or in this community? Wow. The vision of Rhodes, Carlton, and Price in 1874, former slaves bought, did I hear it say bought, two acres of land on this hallowed ground and said, we have a vision from God to do ministry right here. That's opportunity leadership. That's making your opportunity. And what are you continuing to do? You're living into it, new Sardis. Hallelujah. Amen. You are doing something right here nobody else can. You're capturing that easy win, what God has blessed you with. That's why it's easy, right? You had forebearers before you. They've planted the seeds. They've paved the way, and you're continuing to drive this ship forward. Hallelujah. Grateful for your ministry. <sighs> Nehemiah captured the easy wins. The king was there. He was number two. He knew where to get the resources, and he got them. The R, the R of leadership. I like this one. We alluded to it a little bit earlier. Ready, aim, and then shoot, fire, whatever you want to say. Let's think about basketball instead. Get ready. You know, them guys get on the foul line, right? You don't see them. They don't get the ball and just, they get ready. Some of them going to dribble. They got their little thing they go through, right? Do it the same way every time. Straighten up their stuff, get the dribbles in, pop it, take their time, right? Ready, aim, and then fire. Boy, I get in trouble when I just fire and I haven't even gotten ready or aimed. How about y'all? Y'all ever do that? Fire off, fire off my mouth at my wife. She says something and I just, boom, wrong thing. Wrong thing. Y'all ever done that? You better hold it. Nehemiah got ready. He had, you know what they like to call this? That's a strategy. 
Y'all didn't just come up with this leadership and legacy thing over one weekend and say, hey, let's do it. There was some strategizing that went into it, wasn't there? There was planning. Nehemiah had a plan. <laughs> Listen to this. It says here in the scripture, in verse 12, we heard it toward the very, oh, no, this is chapter 2 again. Here's what Nehemiah did. He went to the city that was in ruins, Jerusalem. The king let him go and said, I set out during the night with a few others. This is it. He's gotten there. I not told anybody what was on my mind or what God had put in my heart to do. And he was going to do it for Jerusalem, he said. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding. So he got on his mount. He got on his horse, his donkey, whatever it was. Rode through the city and evaluated and developed a plan. When the king asked him what he wanted, I didn't read that scripture earlier. I'll paraphrase it. He was ready for the request. He said, uh, if it pleases the king, can you send letters to the folks in Lebanon? I'd like some of their good wood. Can you send me safe passage through this other region where I can get where we need to go? I got a plan here. I've been thinking about this, and it's from the Holy Spirit. Will you help equip me? Friends, let's continue to lead in that way. I know I'm going way too long here. We're going to talk lastly. Talk lastly about the last four principles. Did we get all the leader in? We got that in, didn't we? The last four principles of leadership. I share with pastor. I said, let's title this sermon, The Ship in Leadership. Because to me, these are the quintessential aspects of leadership. I spoke to you a little bit about strategic leadership earlier. Those leaders, that's kind of the things that you make stuff happen with. These last four is just leadership in general. What's innate in us? What is innate in our ability to lead in a church and community? You know, I, uh, I think about these four principles in, in this leadership, that word ship. And some of you have probably been on a big ocean-going ship. Maybe it was a cruise line or perhaps serving in, in the military. But, you know, me being a little country boy from Mississippi, I get in them little bass boats. It's about the biggest I get into. A little fishing boat. Usually ain't got nothing but a trolling motor. But no matter how big that ship is or how small, there's something that's unseen. And small in comparison to the larger vessel that moves it all along its journey, right? What's it? It's a propeller, right? A propeller. Unseen to the eye, small in comparison to the larger movement, even always, almost always overlooked. But without that propeller, what? That ship is going nowhere. So, friends, these principles of leadership are essential for us as leaders in the model of our Lord Jesus Christ in the example given us by Nehemiah. I want y'all to help me with them. These last four principles that are innate in us if we're going to be leaders in our faith tradition. What do you think the S is of the ship in leadership? Service, come on. It's in your mission statement, isn't it? You put it right up here on your church. Serve. Nehemiah said it twice just in those little bit of readings we had today. I was the cupbearer. I was servant to the king. Friends, I mean this with every part of, I feel like that is my ministry at Memphis Theological Seminary. I have to sign legal documents all the time. They want to know who is the CEO of this institution. More than the chief executive officer, I believe I am to be the chief servant of our institution. And that's my heart's desire. How else can a country talking preacher from rural Mississippi, I'm not even from the big city, at least Harrington was in Jackson, I'm from the country. How can a country talking preacher from Mississippi become the president of Memphis Theological Seminary except through God's grace and understanding that and wanting to serve as I've been served? So the S of leadership is servanthood. What about the H? What do y'all think about that? 
Come on, I heard it. Help, I like that. What about humility? We need to be a little humble, don't we? Come on. Those go hand in hand, don't they? The humbler, is that a word, humbler? The more humble we are. Don't tell them at Memphis Theological Seminary I said humbler now. You're going to fire me next week. The more humble we are, the more willing we are to serve, right? We know we are nothing without God's grace. Oh, but God's grace is our only option. The eye of leadership. What do y'all think about that one? Come on, Pastor. I promise we didn't practice this. You heard him, didn't you? Integrity. Let your yes be yes. Don't manipulate. Don't make up stuff. Be true. Nehemiah, y'all got to read this book. Go read it. Hey, you get that Bible Gateway app, it'll read it to you if you want. You'll be driving down the road. Y'all ever do that? He talks about sand ballot, making up stuff. He's making up stuff saying, oh, here's the report. The report's done got back to the king that there's a new king in Jerusalem. You, you moving out from in under our king, and you're going to set up your own kingdom in Jerusalem. You, you know what he said? Nehemiah said, man, you're talking out of your head. You're just making up stuff. I am doing this with integrity. The king knows what I want to do, and it's to serve our people in Jerusalem, not to serve me. Friends, if you want to be a leader, hold your integrity. You know what? You can't trick kids and you can't trick dogs. You ever notice that? They know it. They know it. If you ain't living the truth, and you can't trick your church folk or your team, your FedEx team, right? The team you work with, your coworkers, they know the truth. If we're not living and leading with integrity, who's going to follow us? They, they're not going to follow you. Live it out. Protect it, guard it, cherish it. You've built it for a lifetime. It can lose it in one night, one mistake. My favorite letter. Y'all know what this one is. The P in the ship, what's that going to be? Prayer. Most important, we talked about it throughout. You're never going to live enough to be able to make all the mistakes you got to make. You got to learn from other people's mistakes. And you got to learn to be sustained through prayer even in spite of our imperfection. And God will do it. God will do it. Y'all, I, I, amen. Yes. Give God a hand. Yes. I cherish my prayer life. I drive right now from my hometown in Faulkner, Mississippi, a little bitty spot in the road. There's one red light between Memphis and Corinth in Walnut. I don't know if y'all know where that is. Highway 72. Take that right, head down to my little hometown. Jacob Gurley has to go a little further to get to Blue Mountain College where I used to serve with my brother there. And it takes me about an hour to get to Memphis, and that's my prayer time every morning. Quiet time, prayer time, studying the Scripture. And look, hear me now. I'm not saying that to tell you how holy I am. I'm telling you to say how broken I am. How weak I am. How much I need more of God and less of me. I've tried it on my own. I've tried to go under my own strength. Have you? And I have found there's nothing but the blood of Jesus revealed to us through prayer to cover all of our sins, to be our strength in our weakness, to be our light in our darkness, to be our hope in despair, to be love wherever there's hate is found in prayer. Friends, when people come to talk to me about counseling, pastor, they come needing help. You know what my first question is? How's your prayer life? How are you and God working this out? We better rely on the one who is our sustainer and our maker every day. Be fervent. Be fervent. Okay, I'm, I, we got to talk a little bit about Jesus, just a little bit. We're going to close it out with Jesus. 
We talked about Nehemiah. He was a man of prayer, a leadership, all these various qualities. Hold on to this. One of my favorite passages in Scripture. When you think about this ship, is there anybody that ever walked the face of this earth who embodied those attributes more than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Our brother Paul would say it this way as he wrote to the church in Philippi. You remember that passage? Paul said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. He had integrity. But yet, he said he humbled himself. Taking on the form of a servant or a slave and emptied himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He is our ship. He is our Savior. And if we continue to give him this church, our life, our family, our ministries, he will move us as we lead this community and those we love more in his image and for his glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Come on, new Sardis. Come on, new Sardis. Blessed our souls this morning with leadership. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. This is a historic day. And I know some of you were wondering, well, we've never had anybody like Dr. Hill to come and to preach the gospel. But the